Hello, this is Yasmin from the Risk Being Seen podcast, and this is a podcast where I get to ask all sorts of questions that normally people just look at me funny when I ask. So I'm super excited to have Alan Burton with me today. He is the creator of the Truth Health Freedom podcast. He's also a singer, but I'm not going to make him sing. But his podcast is focused on natural health and healing, truth-seeking, consciousness, and empowerment. So, Alan, thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, in your intro to your podcast, you mentioned um, your own personal struggles with health uh, that went on for a very long time. And I just wanted to ask you, what were the really big things that you learned? Because you've been on this journey into health for a long time. What were the big things that really turned that around for you? Ah, the big things. Nutrition was the main thing. Okay. And detoxification. And the two go hand in hand. Okay. So um, the first time I had, uh, I had a big sort of itching and insomnia problem really the itching would cause the insomnia and that went sure. on for 14 years and oh my it was gosh terrible itching and the, the first thing that gave me relief was having colonic hydrotherapy okay which, um, i'd never considered before but someone suggested to me that it might help what they said was it would help remove the traces of medication because I'd been on medication, all sorts of pharmaceuticals for years and years and years, trying to treat all my symptoms mm-hmm. um, and usually just making me worse in the long run. And so that's why I went for it in the first place. And I realized, oh, I got relief from that. And so my skin, it would like, yeah. So when I had the colonic hydrotherapy, the fire would go out in my skin. It would be taken from a level of, 100 to a level of 75 or okay. 60, but then it would come back a few hours later, but it showed me that something going on from the inside, it's mm-hmm. what happens in the gut is causing what's happening on the skin, causing the hair to fall out, causing the sleepless nights, causing everything else. And yeah, I was experimenting with nutrition. I went to see a nutritionist. I went to see a herbalist and Slowly, slowly, slowly over the years, I managed to start turning things around, but it's all about healing the gut and repopulating the microbiome and putting in the foods that heal and avoiding the foods that harm and finding the right information. That's the hard part because there's so much contradictory information out there. And I had a very tricky learning curve with lots of wrong turns along the way, but by trial and error and through the beauty of the internet, um, I was able to find what I believe to be the right way, what I believe to be the truth, certainly what, what was the truth for me that worked for me. And um, yeah, now I'm in pretty good health. So yeah, it works. And once you've found the truth, stick to it, you know, stick to it day by day. Tr- trust the process. Mm-hmm. Trust that if you keep doing the right things, you might not feel the difference immediately. But in a few weeks, a few months, or even years, and it did take years, you will feel the difference. I have so many questions. So, well, you said there's, there's good advice <clears throat> and there's bad advice, but you say some mm-hmm. things you have to try for years. So how do you know? Like, at what point do you know if it was good or bad or if you waited too long or if you didn't wait long enough? Like, that seems like just such incredible trial and error and so much patience. So, like... What was good and what was what ended up being good for you and what ended up being bad? Okay, um, something I used for years was something called Udo's oil, Udo's choice oil. Okay, so and I used to put so it's like a cold pressed oil made of seeds, organic seeds, and it gives you the apparently the perfect blend of omega 3, 6, and 9. And I'm sure Dr. Udo Erasmus won't like me saying this, but. I used to think that this is really good for you Mm -hmm. because all the marketing says it's good for you. And even a lot of nutritionists would say it's good for you. Mm -hmm. And over time I learned that it's not so good for me. And I think it did help my skin in some ways because it was kind of moisturizing from the inside almost. Um, But so it can help to produce more oils for the skin, which, which can be very healthy and healing. 
but on the flip side, it's also very bad for you. And I think it left me feeling very tired and I wasn't very, I didn't have much get up and go for a few years. And I kept, and yeah, there came a time when I started hearing people saying that oil is bad for you. And I didn't understand why, um, because it's, it's organic, it's cold pressed and all these people over here tell us that it's really good. And these people are doctors and they're producing health foods. So it must be good. And I, these people were saying it's bad, but I didn't see the evidence. I didn't see where's the science, where are the doctors backing this up? And then I did come across the doctors who were backing it up with the science. So there's a site called nutritionfacts.org. And there's a doctor called, <clears throat> so nutritionfacts.org is Dr. Michael Greger. And there are other doctors who he's kind of associated with, you know, they go to the same conferences, they're, they're roughly on the same page. And they were saying pretty similar things that um, oil is actually not good for you. And within weeks of probably days of stopping using oil, um, my energy level started to go through the roof. Wow. And I realized that I need to be getting my oils from within the matrix of the plant. So it's the whole food. So oil is it's the equivalent of white sugar, but of the fat world. So white sugar is of the carbohydrate world and oil is of the fat world. And wow. it's, it's just isolated oil and all the fiber is taken out and loads of the nutrients are lost. And then it acts in the body in a completely different way. So I do have lots of seeds, I have lots of nuts, I have avocados, I have all these things, but in the whole plant form, and then the oils are still getting into my body but in the right way, and it acts very differently, and I feel very different. Well, yeah, I, I've come across the same thing. I was like, oh, you know, coconut oil, is these mm. things are good for you, and blah, 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 and then I started saying, no, I know all that's that's really bad. There is, like you said, so much conflicting information. So do you think the best thing for people to do is, do you think there's a reliable source? What, what, are there reliable sources that you go to that are the best for information? Or do you think everyone has to just kind of try stuff on their own? Well, I think, um, so I discovered it probably two and a half, three years ago. Nutritionfacts.org was a turning point in my life. Okay. Definitely. Because that was the first site I found that just backed everything up with peer-reviewed data and it backed it up with the science and it and he he would always say his piece so on the, on that site you get lots of little videos a few little articles that are really bite-sized videos that bring you the science in layman's terms but they always reference the science they're not afraid to reference the science and they're not selling anything that's another key they're not yeah he has his books but he's not selling any products he's not mm -hmm. selling any supplements and that you know, he does recommend one or two supplements, um, but he's not selling any. And that gives me a lot of faith that he's telling the truth. And, and I think I then once I'd found that site, I came across other doctors, like I say, who, who are on the same page, who, who are with him. And yeah, so that would be my first port of call if I had to recommend any site to anyone. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for the tip. Um, because, yeah, there's just so much, and you mentioned supplements. I mean, that's such a huge, huge market. Like, oh, my gosh, going to Amazon, and if you type in, like, weight loss or whatever, just how much, I mean, yes, and I'm going to admit, how much money have I spent personally? More than, yeah, more than, I'm just like, I have these, all these pills. I'm like, what was I thinking? Just hoping for a solution in a bottle, which is so, I know, to be just so foolish. But yeah. in I've some moment of weakness. Yeah, I used to do the same. I spent fortunes <clears throat> on supplements down the years and, and now I spend so much less on my health than I used to spend because I found the truth. Um, unfortunately, the truth doesn't make millions of dollars for people. It's not a multi-billion dollar industry, um, but I feel much better for it. I think a good book that reveals all is called Whole by T. Colin Campbell. Okay. And as the title suggests, he's talking about whole food as opposed to supplements, you know, and 
how that acts very differently within the body. And the body's more intelligent than any scientist, really. You give it the right ingredients, avoid the wrong ingredients, and the body's like a self-healing machine. It knows what to do. And it will. It will do, what it's, it will do its job if you give it a chance. Um, so that brings us to the next topic I want to ask you about, and that was fasting. Okay. All right. Okay. So what kind of fasting do you do? How long have you been doing it? How did you, how did you come across it? I'd love to, to hear your experience because I don't, I don't know a lot of people who do it. Okay. Um, it's relatively new to me. Um, I only did it for the first time last year. Okay. It's something I wouldn't have considered in the past until I came across the information. And I think coming across the information is just one thing leading to another. I'll be on YouTube and I'll be learning something about nutrition and then I'll see something about fasting and you keep hearing people talking about it. And Mm -hmm. one day I decided to look into it and the health benefits seemed quite profound. Um, So I was listening a lot to Dr. Alan Goldhammer, who I interviewed Mm -hmm. last week when I was having that panic attack (laughs) and uh, yeah I just learned that it can be very very beneficial so I decided to try which was a big step for me because I've always been very lean so I'm someone who I don't think I'm too lean I just have a very I have a small frame but I've had all my life people telling me you need to put some meat on your bones uh, Mm -hmm. and you need to put some weight on. And then we have a society that, that bombards you with imagery, whether it be Hollywood or magazines that saying a man should look like this. And it's always a stereotypical bodybuilder type. And so, yeah, all my life, that's the message I've had. And so there's a part of me that's kind of afraid to lose weight. I'm afraid, Oh, if I fasted, I'd be far too thin. Mm-hmm. And I think that is just our conditioning, but I just, you know, I realized that and I decided I'd give it a go anyway. And at first I was going to see if I could do two or three days. And then I started feeling so good that I thought, I'll just try it for a bit longer. And this was last October. And I went for seven days, <gasps> eight nights last October. Wow. And the benefits were so profound. I could feel all sorts of healing going on in my body and I felt fantastic afterwards and and my mind it it changed it seemed to cleanse my mind as well because toxicity in your body will affect your mind your microbiome affects your mind as well and fasting affects the microbiome and it removes toxicity and then I decided to try again I think about five months later it's the end of February, early March, and I did 10 days, 11 nights on that occasion. And again, felt huge amounts of healing going on. And if I had the time and the money, I'd go somewhere where I could be medically supervised and I'd, I'd take a full break and probably do it for a bit longer because I just think it's the ultimate reset for the body that's been living in a toxic world and filled with toxins, you know, for years and years, so many pharmaceuticals. And yeah. So, okay, so this is something that you do um, every once in a while or every month or sort of every other month. You'll just do a really big, long fast. Well, it, I've never, I've only done it twice. In Oct- October last year, the end of February to early March this okay. year. That, and I'll probably, I don't know, six months' time, I might decide to do it again. It's just finding the time because you do really need to be able to rest. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's the medical recommendation. It's finding the time and um, you know, having the opportunity. But I didn't really, I did lose weight during the fast. Sure. But I actually put the weight back on better than ever afterwards because I feel like my gut was so well healed that I'm absorbing more of the nutrition now than I ever was before. Ah, so everything just levels out afterwards. So I'm not too worried about the weight loss. It, it, it alarms other people, and I'm I'm concerned about what they might think. But it doesn't concern me because I've done so much learning 
and I know my own body so well that mm -hmm. I know that even a lean a lean person could fast safely for 40 days you know if they wanted to medically supervised I wouldn't do that without medical supervision but uh, yeah <laughs> wow that's amazing so uh my friend Don he uh He's one of those people that's just very educated in my mind, right? So he came a few years ago. He's also my office mate. And he's like, oh, I'm going to start doing this fasting thing. Mm -hmm. So what he does, I think, is uh, for like one week out of the month, or actually the first five days of the month, he just cuts his calories uh, like in half. Yeah. And that's what he does. And I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting, Don. Sure, whatever. And then like, like you said, you just start hearing about it in different places. And like so a few years later – something else came up and I, and I saw uh, the BBC documentary about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, okay, Don's been doing this. I'm seeing all this health stuff. I'm watching this documentary. Maybe this is something I should try. So um, on and off for the past few years, I've done the um, intermittent fasting. Yeah. So I do maybe 18 to 20 hours a day, depending on, you know, kind of what I'm feeling like. I try not to be too strict about it. And so I do that most of the time just because i'm better when i'm on a routine mm -hmm. um but also i'll just take days off where i just don't feel like it or i don't want to do it uh but for me the first time when i did it even just doing that that intermittent fasting for about a, a week and a half i noticed that a bunch of skin issues that i've had for years and years just vanished mm. I was like, oh, I've always had this dry skin. And I just kept putting lotion on it thinking, oh, I have dry skin. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it was just gone. And I was like, okay. And then I had little wrinkles under my eyes. You know, I'm a 40-something woman. And the wrinkles got smaller. And I was like, wow. That was incredible to me because that definitely told me that something inside my body was changing, right? If your skin is your largest mm -hmm. organ, then something in terms of like cellular regeneration was definitely happening. And I was like, okay, that's all enough evidence, you know, for me, plus the cognitive, just feeling better, right? Just feeling better. Yeah. And have the benefits remained. Yes. So even when, you know, you've done your intermittent fast and then you go back to regular eating for however long you do that and you still kept the benefits. Yes. It, it'll, it'll kind of taper off. Yeah. But it's still, it's never gone back to the way it was before. Mm, yeah. What you mentioned about the mind and, and the skin, I, I noticed that in my skin. I actually sh almost shed my skin after the 10-day fast. It was like, I was like a snake shedding, literally shedding my skin. Uh -huh. uh, and then it was renewed and it felt fantastic. And it's been fantastic ever since. And, and what you said before, you used to put the lotion on. I, I was the same. I used to use a lot of lotions. I don't use any lotions at all these days because I don't need to. So I don't need the supplements anymore. So when I was unwell, I used to use so many supplements. I used to use so many lotions and I now realize I don't need them. And I never did need them. If only I could have found the way to health and now I've found that way. So I don't need all those things. So I can save the amount I must save a year is enormous compared to what I used to spend. Yeah. Because I, found, because I found the truth, you know, because of the internet, because it gives us that universal access to information that we can learn these things. You know, you were able to watch a BBC documentary, even though you live in the States, you know, was that Michael Mosley? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. And the what's five, his name? Um, Walter Longo. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah, Dr. Goldhammer mentioned him a lot. I just want to mention something in case anyone's listening here. Um, you know, I did say I was learning a lot from Dr. Goldhammer's interviews and presentations on YouTube. I want to mention he would never recommend doing fasts of the length I did unsupervised. Yeah. Um, he would recommend if I'm going seven, 10 days and medically supervised. If you're doing, say, three days over a weekend, that's, that's okay. Um, but never never the long ones medically super un, medically unsupervised and i wanted to say that just in case anyone was thinking that he recommends that he doesn't that's that was my decision my own personal decision based on everything i'd learned and my own knowledge of my own health and my own body i was very confident that i'd be okay I that's have done it otherwise. a very good note yeah doing extended fasting and definitely 
for people um, than just start small. Do your research, first of all, and then start small, you know, 12 hours, mm. 14 hours, you know, work your way up and because it does take some time for your body and your mind and everything to, to adapt to it. Um, yeah. But yeah, I found it to be so beneficial. And like you said, you save money on all kinds of products and supplements you don't need anymore. And plus just saving money on food. You know, yeah. skipping a couple <laughs> of meals per week is, is surprisingly significant over time. Yeah, adds up. Adds up over the year, definitely. And you can even do, I think, Dr. Clapper, that's it. Dr. Michael Clapper, he... He does work in conjunction with uh, Dr. Goldhammer sometimes at the True North Health Center. And there's a video of him online and he says you could do, a, say, two or three day fast, like a Friday night to Monday morning. You could do that safely twice a month, he says. And imagine the money you save there, you, mm -hmm. you know, think for two days, that's, um, say, for example, four days a month. So, yeah, it's about... 44 days a year where you're not is that no 54 i can't even add up <laughs> i don't know i'm my brain's not working i need to fast again <laughs> <laughs> yeah fasting will help your math skills but possibly so while i was fasting i got so many tasks done that had been procrastinated for so long mm -hmm. procrastination during the fast just disappeared I was just on the case with everything, you know, sorting out everything that needed sorting out. You know, it was incredible. That is really cool. The longest I've ever done is just uh, 48. Mm. Uh, but it's still like, it, it felt euphoric. <laughs> like I felt yeah. so amazing when I hit 40. It's just like, you know, I'm not hungry. I'm not tired. I feel very focused and just... Like you said, it's amazing how tiring, eat, you know, how exhausting it is to have your digestive system running all the time and you don't realize how it like kind of just brings your energy level down. So it, it feels really amazing. Yeah, yeah. And it's probably quite natural for us to, to go periods of time without food. Um, you know, if we're going back to earlier in our evolution, we would be hunting and gathering and there would be times of scarcity and we can survive and that's again something dr goldhammer said a, a chimpanzee can't fast that's our closest relative they can't fast in the way that we can and hence they've had to stay in a certain part of the world because they couldn't cross the desert or anything like that and move out of africa and spread across the world because they couldn't survive for days and weeks at a time until they found food so humans are naturally adapted to fasting and it, and we we go through these different metabolic processes as we do there are different stages and and it's actually good for us i mean i could feel while i was in the middle of the long fast i could feel old injuries i could feel the inflammation around them as they started to heal up you know there'd be scar tissue uh, like on an old achilles injury and afterwards the scar tissue was much less than before because the, the body will kind of go into this repair mechanism and it will also eat what shouldn't be there. So if there's an excess of scar tissue, it will just kind of metabolize it to get some food out of it. It's just amazing to feel it at work and you can feel it at work. It's, it's quite incredible. Yeah, I went to a, I'm in a, a fasting Slack channel online and, um, a man came in and was asking questions and he said that he had been diagnosed with cancer and that he had found some research saying that fasting before doing the chemotherapy actually helps you feel better. You don't feel the effect of the chemotherapy as much and actually improves cancer treatment. And I was like, whoa, right? That's pretty, that's pretty intense that just fasting before you go in for chemotherapy can improve how you feel. Yeah, I've heard yeah. that and potentially the outcomes as well. I mean, yeah. I don't know what the human data is off the top of my head, but I remember I've heard mentioned that the data with rats, uh, they've ex obviously they experiment on rats first. The, the data on rats is really strong, that the survival rates are much greater when they're fasting during 
before the chemo or during. I'm not sure exactly when. So that, that combination. <laughs> Obviously, you need you need the information. You need the doctors who who can tell you how it works. But that's amazing. And how's your friend now? I think he found that it did help him. Yeah. Yeah. He got through. I think he's still struggling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's really sad. But. Yeah. Well, I wish him well, wish him well. But the, yeah, profound benefits. Um, Dr. Goldhammer's got some peer-reviewed published papers. Um, he's got one about uh, lymphoma. Someone was in water fasting just for 20 days at his clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, the lymphoma halved during that time. And then through the fasting and then afterwards, the whole food plant-based diet, the lymphoma remained at that at that halved size. And I do remember reading somewhere that this uh, patient does want to go back and, and do it again to try and get it all the way down. And this is peer reviewed stuff, you know, um, the, the cynical uh, people have had to accept that, yeah, this has genuinely happened. And uh, yeah, they're, they're doing a follow up paper now apparently. So that should be published soon, but it's just amazing. It's amazing stuff. It is, and, and going back to something you said earlier about how, you know, there's no money in fasting. You know, just there's, people don't maybe want us to know about this kind of thing because there, you can't sell somebody something and say you're fasting. There's no money. It's, 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 it's free. Yeah, it's the same in nutrition. You know, there's no big broccoli lobby that's something dr gregor says all the time he always mentions big broccoli you know like big <laughs> farm. so there is a big supplements industry that mm -hmm. is huge and the marketing behind that is enormous the pharmaceutical industry is even bigger the fast food industry is humongous mm -hmm. so you've got all these food industries the pharmaceutical industries the supplement industries but the you know, the organic whole food farmer, he's not very big and mm -hmm. it's harder for him to, to make money and, and get his message out there. So, yeah, if you, if you don't look for it, it's, it's going to be hard to come across it. Because if you watch TV, you'll just see the adverts that you see on TV. If you mm -hmm. go to um, a sporting occasion, you'll just see the adverts for Budweiser and McDonald's and all those kind of things. So if you want to find the truth, you've kind of got to look for it, really. But once you do look for it, it is out there these days in a way that it wouldn't have been 20 years ago. And you can find the truth. And uh, then you can make your choice. What's yeah, it's, it's, it's just so not obvious. And the things that we take for granted of, oh, you're just supposed to eat three meals a day. Yeah. You know, you just, yeah, you have to have breakfast. It's so important. And then suddenly I was like, reading something like, no, that's totally, you know, this food industry that's kind of been telling you that because they sell breakfast foods that way. It's like, is that right? You know, like all these things that were just sort of culturally kind of ingrained to accept mm. as being normal. Um, yes. And it's like, wait, wait, maybe, maybe I, it never occurred to me to question any of that. Mm. Right. You just kind of do what everybody else does. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's something to do with the industrial revolution. So, the idea of a nine to five kind of routine mm -hmm. or an eight to six or however long people work, that structured pattern of the day where you have a rush hour in the morning and you have a rush hour in the evening and you're not allowed to eat during your job. So you try and make sure you eat first and eat when, if you get a lunch break and you eat when you're finished. So these structured times and these routines that are so set in stone, the partly marketing like you say and the partly i think a legacy of, of the industrialized age um i definitely feel better having fruit throughout the day and and kind of traveling light i do feel much better that way so all i've had today is fruit i'm gonna have some cooked food after this so it's half past five late afternoon early evening here mm -hmm. and all i've had is fruit and i feel fantastic that's that's why i've been alert and alive and i've got things done today Okay, so we've talked a lot about food and fasting and that kind of aspect of, of, of healing. I would love to mm -hmm. ask you a couple other questions 
about, oh man, there's so much stuff. You mentioned as your podcast also being one of, one of the topics you, that you wanted to focus on was consciousness. And this yes. is not something I get to talk to a lot of people about. Um, okay. so I would love to kind of ask you, what does that mean to you? Consciousness versus unconsciousness. And like, what does, what does that mean to you? Ah, consciousness. Um, it's so multi-layered. It's so multi-layered. Um, my consciousness has definitely been awakened by eating more cleanly. So I managed to get off all my medication in 2007. So for years before that, I was a walking pharmacy cabinet. And after I came off the medication and started to detoxify, I intuitively began to feel more spiritual. And I can't explain that, but I just did. I felt more connected to the earth and more connected to spiritual things. And at that time, my worldview was quite different. I think when I was younger, I always felt intuitively spiritual, but I kind of listened to science and they were saying, no, we're just an accident of nature and all these molecules just happen to come together and create life. And and there's no such thing as psychic phenomena or spiritual phenomena and that kind of thing. So, but then from about 2007, I started to learn things, mainly because of YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I, again, it's just avoiding the mainstream media. And I did start to come across the evidence uh, for you know, people doing experiments about psychic phenomena. There's a, an Institute of Noetic Sciences. There's a Global Consciousness Project. There are people like... Dean Radin, there's people like um, Greg Braden, there's people like Rupert Sheldrake doing research into consciousness. And that opened me up on an intellectual level. So I was starting to open up in how I felt because of my, my body was cleaner and my brain was starting to get cleaner and maybe my pineal gland was starting to decalcify. Mm-hmm. And I was learning all these things on a theoretical level. And then... Yeah, it's hard to exp- it's so hard to define consciousness. It's just I think we have been raised, certainly I was raised in this culture to think and believe certain things. Mm-hmm. But there is so much more and that's what I'm beginning to wake up to and so many other people that I'm surrounded by are beginning to wake up to. Fasting definitely caused some psycho-spiritual consciousness phenomena during the long fast. It was like every night was full of all kinds of visions and dreams that I was intuitively aware were deeply healing. So it was an altered state of consciousness. I felt the body was not just in this healing mode physically, Mm -hmm. but the consciousness had shifted and it was in a healing mode consciously. And therefore, you, you see things, you, you hear things, you experience and feel things that you might not otherwise feel. And again, it's so hard to pin down. It's so hard to define, but it was going on. And, um, you know, I've got um, a strong interest in, in entheogens or plant medicines as well. And, and that came through, again, just learning through YouTube and eventually coming across the work of Graham Hancock or coming across DMT, the spirit molecule um, with, what's his name with the podcast? <laughs> Joe Rogan. Joe, Joe Rogan. Rogan. Yeah. That one. Yeah. So I just kept coming across all of this stuff and um, yeah, there is definitely far much more than we ever thought there was before. And fasting has definitely woken some of it again, not just the healing state that you're in while fasting not just the altered state they're in while fasting but afterwards because the brain is so much cleaner the body is so much cleaner i think it was graham hancock who describes the brain as a transceiver of consciousness it it receives and it transmits consciousness and the cleaner it gets the better it can do that the more toxic it is 
the less it's able to do that. There's lots of stuff on the internet about calcification of the pineal gland. I don't know mm. whether the science behind that is real, but I'm, a, I'm acutely aware that the cleaner, the cleaner my body is and the cleaner my brain is, the more, the more variety of states of consciousness I seem to experience. And I don't need plant medicine to do so. So for example, a week ago tonight, I went to an event with maestro shaman Richard Down, who's, who's featured in episode three of my podcast. And he's using sound healing instruments. He's using drum rhythms and he's using Icaros, which are songs that he got from the ayahuasca medicine when he was in Peru. And pretty much everyone in the room was experiencing an altered state. And I think it's easier to experience when everyone's in the room. Nobody's taking any illegal substances. No one's taking any medicine. But these rhythms and the dancing and the movement um, have been used for millennia to create altered states and communicate with spirit and, and to cleanse ourselves of unwanted energies and to allow in the energies that we do want. Shamanic cultures have used these things for years. You know, um, can't think of the words, but you see shamanic drums, you see shamanic dances. Um, the Native Americans did it, the Siberian shamans do it, they do it in the Amazonian jungle all over the world. There's the Buiti tradition in Gabon. And um, yeah, these, these traditions, the dance, the music, the singing, have been finely tuned over millennia to get people into these states and in these states they experience profound healing so i know i had an email today about a breathwork session i've got another email in my inbox about a gong bath session and so these sound vibrations and the things that happen when people use certain types of breath put them in an altered state of consciousness and in that state of consciousness they're able to access healing and something i've come to understand is that sometimes when you get the brain out of the way, the, the kind of conscious mind that we think of as our rational, conscious, everyday state of, of being, once we get that out of the way, some profound healing can take place. It's, it's quite amazing. And, and like I say, it's more powerful, like last Saturday, if there's a group of people, because the energetic field, the consciousness, kind of you tune into the collective it's like you sense an atmosphere if you're in a stadium if you're at a gig you sense an atmosphere because that collective consciousness I, I can't explain it scientifically but I've felt it I've experienced it and I know it to be real did any wow. of that make sense that's really <laughs> that's really beautiful um cause I'm not sure I've ever experienced that and now I'm just like that sounds amazing. I'm going to go listen to, you know, the episode from your podcast and I want to know more. Um, and it's so funny for me to sit here and think as the 40 something year old me, it's just like, yes, I want that. That sounds cool. What is he talking about? I don't know, but it sounds amazing. I want to do this. I want to feel it. I want to experience it. I know the 20, 20 something year old me, Alan, mm. would just be like, what are you talking about? What kind of you know, strange woo-woo nonsense is this. And it's so funny for me now to look at that person who I was then and just, I look at them with, with love and just like, you just weren't ready for this, right? Yeah. My brain at that point was just not ready for this. My perception, my worldview, like you said, was so small, right? And still so young and so sheltered. And, but now I'm just like, I've heard all the things that you've talked about. I've sort of heard mentioned either through Joe Rogan or through the London Real uh, podcast or all these other areas. And now I'm just like, yes, I'm curious, right? I want to know more. I'm, I'm kind of ready for it, right? It's yeah. so funny. So it's funny how, so yeah. Many. It's happening to so many people. I think, wh whereabouts are you in, in the States? California, Northern California. California. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure you'll be able to find because I think a good place to start would be if you can find any native peoples who still practice the native traditions, uh -huh. 
you know, within range of where you are. Because I know a lot of people who've done, for example, the vision quest, which is where they're fasting in, in the dark for so many days. Um, people who've done sweat lodges. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've done a sweat lodge again. It was last, last autumn uh, here in the UK, uh, a friend of mine who did spend time in America and he did work with native peoples and he discovered um, sweat lodges there. Um, again, you know, we're, we're talking about becoming open to these kind of things these days. He was becoming open to it 20 years ago, this friend of mine. Mm-hmm. So he regularly holds sweat lodges over here and you, you fast throughout the day. And again, fasting to bring in that altar state. He works with the drum, works with prayer. You're sweating out the toxins and you're not just sweating out the toxins, but you are making prayers for the things that you want to release while you're in there. And you're in the dark as well, which again helps with the altered state. So again, a couple of miles away from me, and it was actually inspired by Joe Rogan. There was a flotation tank. Um, it's, it's not open anymore because the guy couldn't make any profit out of it. Um, but it's someone who listened to Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan's talking about this flotation tank where you lie in the salty water and you're completely in the dark. It's completely silent. Your, your body's not touching anything solid and you just lie there. And because you're not distracted by the, the solid things and the imagery and the sounds that we're normally distracted by, then we can go deep inside and find something. And it, yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> so mainstream that there was one of those a couple of miles from my door. I never tried it before it closed, but it just shows things are changing and more and more and more people are waking up to this. And I think it's a beautiful thing. I really, really do. And I think these are incredibly exciting times that we're living in and we're having conversations that we would not have been having 10 years ago. And I love that. And I can't, can't wait to see where it goes because if you think, I mean, I'm, I'm the same. I'm in my 40s. I hope to have another 55, 60 years of life, you know, barring accident uh, or some serious illness. I, I, I really hope to look after myself and have a long life. And just think of the changes that have happened in the world in the last 55, 60 years. Just utterly enormous changes look at what we're doing now we're speaking face to face across the world for free from our own homes and that's just incredible so i'm i think it's these are really exciting times there's a there are a lot of problems in the world some terrible things going on in the world but the fact that consciousness is awakening and awakening fast and spreading gives me a lot of hope gives me a lot of hope i agree i think it's it's double-sided there's two i think there's 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 two sides to the coin and one is that yes there's all these things happening and so much potential for good and for healing and for Mm. growth and but i want to caution people who are listening to this also is that there's there's a part of me too that that worries for people, the same people who jump into fasting without doing the research Mm. and can get themselves into trouble or into danger, um, that people need to do their research first, right? Like talk to people, read online. Everyone wants everything instantaneously, right? We want, I want consciousness now, Alan, right now. It's like, well, (laughs) before you go jump into a sweat lodge, before you go jump into a 10 day fast where you know you need to like, Take it, slow it down. That's, I think, another level to all of this is slow it down, think about it, do things safely. You know, mm. you can't get, you know, elevated consciousness in a bottle. You actually have to kind of, you know, ease into it in order to, to do things safely. And I'm sure there's people out there that are doing these things and to try to make money off of this. Oh, there are. There yeah, are. and so you really want to be careful that you're not, getting into something that, that you don't understand that's, that's potentially harmful. Yeah, yeah, definitely do. I absolutely agree. Do your research. Find people you can trust. Talk to people that you can trust. Do as much research as possible because there are people out there who are very ready and willing to exploit vulnerable people. Oh, 
those in most desperate need because there are people we've talked about the healing potential mm -hmm. there are people who are desperate for healing and they will pay anything to get healed and people know that and they can and will and do take advantage and the same happens even you know in the jungles of peru some native shamans take advantage of people and people think, oh, but no, they're, they're native people, they're enlightened, they're not going to do this kind of thing. People are people, and there's good and bad in everyone. So you really, really need to do your research first. Absolutely. Agree 1,000% with that. Yeah, and that's the struggle for me is to have the right amount of skepticism or, you know, rigor, but mm. also being open at the same time, right? It's a very uncomfortable kind of um, cognitive dissonance there to be able to do both and, mm. and make a good decision. But right? we are supposed to be able to do it. You know, we have a head and a heart. We have mm -hmm. a body and a soul. We have mm -hmm. a left brain and a right brain. So we actually, I think to live our best lives, we have to learn to blend the science and the intuition, the rationality, and the gut feeling. We have to learn to blend those. And if we've not practiced trusting our instincts, and if we've not practiced that all our lives, we are not going to be so good at it if we start doing it at the age of 40 something. We do need to, like you say, take our time, take small steps. We might make mistakes along the way, but it, it's, a, it's a process of of learning and discovering and slowly, slowly testing your boundaries a little bit. But it, it, is, it is hard. I struggle with it. I really struggle with my cautious, rational mind and the mind that is beginning to rediscover. I wouldn't say discover. It's rediscovering what I think this society trained out of me, which is to trust my intuition and trust my gut feeling. And very often it's right. Um, but it's hard to know because I'm not used to listening to it. I'm not used to trusting it. I'm not used to acting on it. So it's, um, yeah, it's a long, sometimes painful process. Yeah, like you said, I think we're, we're sort of taught in school, science is all there is. We're just, you know, a bag of meat, you know, yeah. driving around you know, brains driving around this bag that we, we do stuff. And I remember for me, I think a turning point was watching a TED talk by a doctor whose name I'm missing, but she talked about the placebo effect. Mm. And that's the first time I'd ever come across anything about like self-healing where she's like, yeah. you guys, everyone says, blah, 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 blah. Here's this medication. And it worked X percent compared, you know, as well as the placebo effect. And she's like, we take that for granted, but like, stop and think about it. There's a placebo effect. You can give people a pill, tell them it's a pill that does nothing and tell, and, and take, and tell them, take it. This is a fake pill and it will still heal them. Like they will have an effect. The, yeah. It is just like, what? And I had never stopped to consider it before. Because even if you're the most completely rational scientist who doesn't believe in anything metaphysical, the brain is still connected to the body. So if you change, so you don't believe in a soul, you don't believe in higher consciousness, you don't believe in telepathy or anything like that. The fact is the brain is wired to the body. So if you change the input into the brain, it's going to change the body. So have you listened to Bruce Lipton at all? Yes. Yes, I have. Yeah. Epigenetics. Wow. Mm. And how when you're in love, you tend to be in the best of health. You know, in those early days of relationship, you, you head over heels in love. And because you're so happy, because you're in a state of love, you're in the best of health. And again, it's the placebo effect. It's incredible. But epigenetics, I've explored some of that through the fasting. Mm -hmm. um, so, but some of the things I've experienced doing shamanic work and doing the fasting. They have been epigenetic things and some of the healing that's gone on. And, it, and it's layer by layer. It's onion layer by onion layer. And some of it's been a real shock. And so, you know, some of the visions and the dreams. But I'm certain that it's epigenetic. You know, Rupert Sheldrake's talked about it as well. You, know, you can take a rat, you can take a male rat, and you can train it to have a certain fear. 
and then introduce that rat to a female who hasn't been trained with them. No, they didn't even introduce the rat to the female. I think they, they took sperm from, from the rat that's been trained to have a fear, the mm -hmm. male rat, and they inseminated the female who's never met the male. That female then has offspring who have never met the father and the mother's never met the father and the offspring have inherited the fear that the father had to learn. So we absolutely inherit things epigenetically, but we can also undo that. And fasting is one way, and plant medicines are another way. And any way in which you can induce a healing state of consciousness can impact upon that healing. It's just, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing, and I'm sure we're only just at the very beginning of understanding it, you know, and we might never rationally understand it. I think some of, some of what goes on, we can't rationally understand it. I don't think science could ever measure it. Science is about being able to measure things. Mm -hmm. And some of it I don't think can be measured. It can only be understood by, okay, if we do this, we get this result. Mm -hmm but we can't measure it and we can never describe the mechanism. We will never be able to <clears throat> understand the mechanism with the rational mind. There's a lot that I now understand. I used to be very, very rational, but there's a lot that I, I now understand and accept, but I could never explain. But I just experience it mm -hmm. and therefore I know it's real, but I could never possibly explain it or explain the mechanism. And I think some things are like that and we just need to, I think I've heard homeopaths talk about this, where they say, if we give this particular substance, we get this effect. We can't explain the mechanism. No science can explain the mechanism. All we know is we give you X, we get result Y. And science likes to explain the mechanism and doesn't believe it unless they can demonstrate the mechanism. But some things are beyond science. Some things are beyond rational mind. Yeah, and, and like you said, it, might, it also might just be not yet, right? There's so many things yeah. in history. Um, what was it, the cholera outbreak? Or, you know, they didn't know that, that um, tainted water was what caused, you mm. know, illness and stuff. And they're just like, no, no, no. And then what was it, the childbirth women epidemic of, of people uh, in Europe dying during childbirth? And the doctors were like, no, no, you know, it's the air and this and that. And it was because the doctors weren't washing their hands, right? They, yeah, they'd be handling dead bodies. and then. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's just like, oh, my God. Like, think about those people who are just like, no, we don't know what this is. Mm, it's the air. It's this. It's like, no, you weren't washing your hands. They didn't know about germs and stuff. Like, yeah. And now it's so completely like, duh. But that's not where they were. So it's entirely possible that that kind of leap will also happen mm. uh, in a lot of these uh, regards. I was listening to another a book last night um, that was written in the 80s. And she's talking about how um, they did some experiment with animals and uh, by giving them some toxic chemical. But this one group of animals didn't get sick or didn't get as sick as the others and they found out it's because the student or whatever who was administering you know the college student that was administering the the uh the experiment was holding the animal and like petting them and touching them and yeah. there and she was like yeah we don't know why this is this book from the 80s it's just like no we don't know why this is blah 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 but she was saying that love right it was it was the love mm -hmm. that, and the wow. care right and now it's like well we kind of know touching releases chemicals you know oxytocin blah 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 has this effect so kind of, we kind of know the chemical means for it now but she didn't know this and this was just the 80s yeah yeah and i think it's both i think there's there's a chemical cascade that is mm -hmm. caused you know when you stroke an animal or when you're and the animal is being stroked so you, the animal gets it we get it mm -hmm. but i think i think there's an energetic thing as well i think there's an energetic field i think there's a heart field um greg braden's done a lot of work on the heart's energetic field he's got this heart math institute i don't understand it scientifically but i understand it in terms of how i feel and what i've experienced but yeah what, what was this book it sounds really interesting oh it was um oh my gosh marianne uh, wilson 
I'm, oh, yeah. I've lis listened to the book 300,000 times. Actually, um, another girl in our class recommended A Return to Love. A Return to Love. Yeah, yeah, I'll look that up. And have you listened to Johan Hari? No. He's no. an addiction expert. He's written, what's it called? Chasing the Scream. I've not read the book. Okay. But I've heard some presentations on YouTube. And I think he recently had an interview with Brian, I think. Okay. I saw the advert. I've not listened to it. Now, he talks about addiction, but in, in terms of getting our emotional needs met. So, again, with animals, um, animals who were given heroin or something like that did not become addicted if they were in a comfortable environment with other animals. So they had companionship, they had warmth, they had comfort, they had food, they had their all their needs met mm -hmm. and that includes their emotional needs and those that were just kind of kept in a cage isolated in a kind of sparse environment so they'd had no emotional needs met they were just kind of fed mm -hmm. to keep them alive they did become addicted mm -hmm. and the same thing seems to apply to human beings so if someone is given enough love at the key stages of life and and even you know once they're grown up they're far less likely to become addicted and far more likely to be able to beat addiction so it's just really fascinating research so it's definitely worth looking up yeah i will definitely look them look up you on hari that sounds really interesting yeah i think this this whole topic is, is so fascinating because there's the science of it. We always want the proof, but then there's, like you said, what we feel and what we know in our heart. And mm. then there's also the factor of just the power of the brain, what you choose to believe. Yes. And I, I didn't really understand this. I started watching um, Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu, and that's one of my favorite um, YouTube channels or podcasts. Mm. And he talked about, he talks about, um, beliefs and just what you choose to believe is is this thing that you choose to believe does it empower you does it help you achieve your goals it and in a sense it doesn't really matter if it's true or not to anyone else it's about what you think hmm. and it's so like it helps you yeah like if i if i choose to believe that i have an imaginary friend that hangs out with me all the time and talks to me and so, and that makes me feel like I'm never alone. If that helps me, why shouldn't I believe that? Like, doesn't that sound completely, kind of sounds kind of bonkers, but it's like, whatever you choose to believe, whether it's this or that, or if I eat this, it makes me better. If I do this yoga or I do this energy healing, it, it makes me feel better. If I believe that it does, then that's yeah. all you need. Like yeah. science can say, can prove it or disprove it. It doesn't really kind of matter at the end of the day if it helps you. Absolutely. As long as you're doing no harm, you know, as long as you're not believing in some psychopathic spirit that's telling you to go and kill people, you know, then it's absolutely fine. So I used to see it. Um, there's a program on the, on the TV in the UK called Songs of Praise, and it comes on a Sunday night. Okay. Based, usually from churches. I haven't seen it for years. I don't even have a telly anymore. But I remember if, if that program was on, and I would see all these people singing hymns in church, and this look on their faces and how I used to envy them because uh, I couldn't subscribe to any religion and I felt it was too rational to believe the doctrine and the dogma. But I used to envy them because I thought if they believe, like your imaginary friend, if they believe in a God who is all loving and will forgive all their sins and will never abandon them, what an amazing feeling that must be. And also to believe that you will go to heaven when you die. That must just make you feel so good. You've got something there, something, someone, whatever you describe it as, that loves you, will always love you, will never abandon you. And you'll go to heaven when you die. So no wonder they have that look on their face. It, it helps people through life. You know, I've heard people who, again, have said, they were able to give up addiction when they discovered God and in whatever form they find God. So as long as it's doing no harm, I, I'm not someone who subscribes to the dogma of religion. I think 
a lot of religion has done a lot of harm over, over the centuries. Um, but, you know, as long as it's done in the right way, as long as you believe things that do no harm, I think that's the key. Do no harm to others, respect and love others. It can be incredibly beneficial, whether it's real or not. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought it back to doing no harm, the same way we talked about <laughs> doing your research for fasting yeah. or for anything else, right? There's always the caveat of do no harm. I feel the same way about religion. It's just my my instinct is to kind of recoil of like, no, all these horrible things have happened to people as a result of yes. people who believe something, who, who thought that other people needed to die because they didn't share the same belief or whatever. And mm. so I can totally get that. Um, so that's a very, very good point. But it's so funny how in today's society, if I said, oh, I have this imaginary friend um, who makes me feel better, they'd be like, okay, you need to go see someone. You have mm. some kind of problem. But if, if I said, oh, that, that person's name is Jesus Christ, they'd be like, oh, well, that's yeah. totally cool. You're just religious. Exactly. Isn't that, exactly. Isn't that odd? That's so odd. Yeah. But if you had an imaginary friend, mm -hmm. I remember watching a podcast from somewhere in Central or South America, and it was a Scottish guy who'd gone over, gone over there and he'd spent time with native peoples. Mm -hmm. And he was explaining how in the developed world, you might be described as schizophrenic. Over there, you're a seer and you've got a gift. And... You're the same person. It's just that over there, they understand what something, or they understand something in a different way. Mm -hmm. They're saying, okay, you are seeing things and you are hearing things. And because they understand it, probably that person can not just learn to live with that. They can learn to thrive with that. And they can actually be of benefit to others because of the gifts that they have. I think it's a bit like in the film Man of Steel, so Superman comes to Earth as a child, Clark Kent, and he's in school and he's discovering his powers. And it's really overwhelming, really overwhelming because he, he hasn't learned to, to understand them and to harness them yet. And if you live in a society, and the same, same happens when General Zod and the bad guys come down as well. At first, they're just utterly overwhelmed by their senses because they're sensing and hearing and feeling so much and they they don't know what's going on and they have to get used to it. And I think if you're raised in a society that doesn't acknowledge that these things are real, you can't possibly learn to harness that power, that side of your consciousness that you, that you have, that's a gift. So yeah, it's, it's an interesting world. And again, 10, 20 years ago, I might have been a little bit open to this, but for the most part, I wasn't, um, but I think I'm really opening up to the, the fact that we don't know a huge amount about our consciousness and perhaps some native peoples do. Some people who have carried on the traditions for thousands of years perhaps under, understand our consciousness better. They don't understand the science in the same way that we do, but they understand a different science, mm -hmm. the science of consciousness in a very, very different way and can you know, use that left brain, right brain, head, heart, body, soul, and they can bridge those realities. And uh, yeah, I just think it's an absolutely fascinating thing. I really do. Yeah, it's funny how um, we think that everything that's, that's new is better. Like, oh, we're so much mm -hmm. smarter and we're so much better. You know, these, these tribes or these cultures or these other civilizations, you know, I was listening to a talk um, by Jordan B. Peterson, and he talked about um, sort of your your older kind of reptile brain, and then you have your mm -hmm. kind of newer, your more modern brain. And he's like, who's to say that the newer thing's better? And I was just like, what? What do you mean? And, and he's talking, and he says, you know, your old brain was, you know, it's so much older. It's existed through evolution so much longer than your newer kind of neocortex and all those other things. What makes you think that, that why is this newer thing better just because it's new? This other thing has existed for so much mm. longer, but we think it's the dumb part of our brain, right? It's so the it's stupid. Five. 
it survived and thrived yeah. longer than the new part ever has. Yes, it yes. It probably didn't make the same mess of the planet that we've made <laughs> with our big brains yeah. that we think are so clever. And then even once we became human, you know, in the modern form with our modern part of our brains, just look at some of the ancient structures. If there was a cataclysm today, mm -hmm. in thousands of years, nothing, next to nothing would survive. There'd be next to no trace of it. And yet we still have the pyramids and we still have these enormous megalithic buildings around the world with blocks of stone over a thousand tons that have been transported over hundreds of miles and cut with absolute precision. And we're saying we can't learn something from the past. You know, look at the stones in Peru in Saxe Huaman, just absolutely enormous stones with strange, what's the word, poly polygonal shapes you know mm -hmm. they're not regular shapes and they all fit together absolutely oh. immaculately and you can't fit a piece of paper between them mm -hmm. and how did they move the stones how did they fit them so perfectly how have these structures survived all the cataclysms and earthquakes and everything else in all the years since then our buildings wouldn't survive like that so yeah we know some things that they didn't know i'm sure we're better at some things than they were but I'm certain that we can learn an enormous amount from those ancient peoples as well. And it's something my guest in episode seven, Brian Forster said, he said, um, there is, he talks about how there is, there is hope and we, we can fix the mess we've made of the world if we can learn from our past, learn from these ancient traditions and then blend it with, our rational scientific knowledge and we mm -hmm. can get out of this mess and we can make the world a better place. That is really beautiful, Alan. Thank you. That feels like a great way to wrap this up. I've kept you for so long. I've enjoyed this conversation so much. I can't, I can't express to you. It's just been so wonderful. Oh, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very, very much for having me. It's just, this is the side of things that I love about podcasting is the communication with other people with open minds and different perspectives across the planet. I love it. Love it. So thank you so, so much. I hope that I'll get a chance to talk to you again. Cause yeah, I, I do want to talk about some more about some, uh, Graham, Graham Hancock stuff. So, uh, okay. Maybe, uh, maybe I'll schedule another one, but thank you again. I really enjoyed this. Everyone, Alan Burton, uh, his podcast is called The Truth, Health, Freedom Podcast. You should check that out. Thank you so much, Alan. Take care. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Okay.